Welcome everyone. This is Amy Parvane. I'm glad to have you on another session of our Chief Growth Officer interviews, where I speak with business professionals who inspire me for all of their work with personal branding, niche marketing strategies, time management, and overall being able to collaborate with other centers of influence in order to grow their practice, but help the end individual as well. On today's session, I have the distinct pleasure of having someone who I've admired for about 10 years now. She probably recognizes because I've been reaching out to her for that long. Um, I first heard about Laura Wasser, as I mentioned, 10 years ago when I started reading all the amazing press about some of the high profile A-list celebrities, ultra high net worth individuals that she was handling the divorce cases for. Some names that you would all definitely recognize, Angelina Jolie, Heidi Klum, Kim Kardashian, Ryan Reynolds, Christina Aguilera, Hilary Duff, Stevie Wonder, Patricia Arquette, uh, Jimmy Iovine, Maria Shriver, most recently, uh, my former alma mater, um, Pimco's Bill Gross and Sue Gross from each other. So the list goes on and on. And I started really being mesmerized by how she does it. And I'm honored to have her on this session today. So Laura, welcome. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And it was wonderful to run into you at the Barron's Top Women's Conference in Palm Beach and uh, have you join us today uh, to have uh, you talk a little bit about your story. I'm not really going to go too much about your bio. There's a lot of great videos about that on YouTube, which I will uh, hyperlink below, um, not to mention that you were conceived on the day your father passed the bar and that your initials are LAW, so you were bound to be in the legal industry um, but what I really appreciate is your time um, and I actually want to kick things off with that with your time management skills one of the top questions everyone who I told to that I'm going to be interviewing was um, talk about her time management skills how does she do it you are covering all these high-profile cases that I just mentioned you're on the covers of uh, industry magazines, newspapers, blogs uh, that you're you know on podcasts. Not to mention you have a, a whole other platform called It's Over Easy, where you're handling you know the mass affluent or the smaller divorce cases at seven hundred to a thousand dollars. That I'll hyperlink below as well. So tell us how you do it. You know you're also a mom of two and a single mom. All of these crazy things on your plate. Uh, we would love to hear from you about how you do that, um, how you manage your time effectively. Well, I wake up very early. I mean, not as early as some of the people that you work with in the investment industry, but we live in California. I wake up at about five, um, kind of click through emails, just chill out a little bit in the morning. I will usually then try to go for a run. Um, and then when I get home, I can wake my kids up. And so now that we've been quarantined, I, it's, we have a little more time because we don't have to get in the car and go to school and everything. We have breakfast. Sometimes my older son will do a morning swim because it's been getting warmer here in California. And really don't start my work day probably until around 7.30 or 8. Um, again, I don't ever have a hearing before 8.30 in the morning. And if we're doing Zoom hearings, which we've been doing a lot of lately here in Southern California, they don't even start until 9.30 or 10. So that gives me time to get stuff done in the morning. Um, we have been doing remote schooling. School ends in a couple of weeks, so that'll kind of be nice for me, although I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do. My older son, who is a freshman in high school, pretty much does his own thing uh, with the remote schooling. My younger son definitely needs some participation and assistance. And, you know, we live in the hills, so sometimes getting online, so it can be a little bit anxiety pr provoking, but it's fine. And on the days that I don't have a full blown Zoom hearing, which actually has me in front of the computer for almost the entirety of the day with a judge, taking testimony, sharing exhibits, um, I'm able to take breaks, have lunch with the kids, do some of their homework with them. So it works. In a normal circumstance, um, you know, like any parent, we, there's a lot of balls in the air. And some days you get to the end of your day and you're like, oh, my God, I juggled all day and everything worked and everything was OK. And probably more than not days you think, oh, my God, I totally screwed everything up. I wasn't a good parent. I wasn't a good lawyer. I wasn't a good CEO of my company. And then you give yourself a break and say tomorrow will be better. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that's a huge concern we have with a lot of our clients that we coach and consult that they say, I ran out of time. I didn't have time for business development. I had to do my day job. And then managing, you know, the kids at home or a family. Uh, are there any secrets or tricks? Because you have 24 hours, and so do they. What are you doing differently that you've been able to become this? And then some of them are striving to get there. I think it's really important to be able to ask for help. I think so many of us, particularly women, feel that if we ask for help, that's going to be a sign of weakness. It's not. People love to be able to help you out. And so being able to say, hey, I could really use some help with this. Fortunately for me, both of my kids' fathers are super helpful, wonderful. Um, if I say I really need a hand with this, they're always willing to lend a hand. Coworkers, colleagues, mentors. Um, I'm lucky my family lives in the area, so they're always able to help. I think asking for help is important. And I also think, you know, having having a schedule where you really, you know, prioritize what's important. My kids years ago told me, you know, during dinner, you turn your phone off. We don't want you on it. We understand that those clients end up paying for the dinner, but you can call them back after. We need you. And they said it was important to them. And at the ages they were at that time for them to be able to articulate that, I was like, it must really be important to them. So I do it. And when it's work time, it's work time. I think it's really important to be very present for whatever you're doing at the moment, not trying to do something with the thought of what the next thing is. Finish it, move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Well, you um, actually, your uh, strategy for your practice is one of the most sought after strategies out there. You're working with the elite, the A-listers, the ultra high net worth, which so many lawyers, CPAs, and financial advisors are really looking to tap into. How did you break into that niche? Not only as such a difficult industry, uh, you know, the upper echelon of the market, but also in probably one of the most overcrowded markets in the world, which is Southern California, where there are so many different lawyers, so many other family attorneys. How have you been able to crack into that industry, but also sustain it for so long, that niche market? Uh, I got lucky. I really did. I mean, I grew up here in Southern California, so I knew a lot of kids who then went into the entertainment industry. Remember, my dad was a, is a lawyer as well. So I, you know, he was already practicing family law when I started working with his firm back in the 90s. Uh, and so, like I said, connections, networking, really making good on uh, your word and your promises with other colleagues, whether they be other family law attorneys or the business managers I work with, the account managers, the investment bankers, um, agents, you know, personal managers and um, entertainment attorneys, all having that kind of reputation for, they generally are working with clients over a long period of time. My colleagues and I are in for maybe six to 18 months getting their divorce done. So they say, we want you to deal with this dirty work, get it dealt with, don't let it bother us, and let our guy or gal get back in front of the camera, onto the field, in the touring venue, whatever it is, so that they can continue making money and all of those professionals get a piece of that action. We bill by the hour. Our job is to kind of come in, resolve the problem, and let them move on. And fortunately, that's really what I have found to be best practice in my field of law anyway. Stringing it out, prolonging the conflict, makes people miserable, it's very expensive, it doesn't make sense. So what we do is a lot of collaborative law, a lot of mediation, a lot of resolution, figuring out from the very beginning of what a case looks like, how it's probably gonna end up, and really giving clients very realistic expectations of what can happen lends itself not to having too much litigation and cutting down on costs. And they and I think when you say, how have you been able to maintain this? That is something that we are known for, which is being very resolution oriented and being um, also, frankly, with the high net worth individuals and with the high profile individuals, very private. We don't advertise. We don't talk about our clients. Anytime you see you know clients we've represented, that's because the public is has access to the filings. One of the prerequisites of being hired by our firm, either as an assistant or a tech person or a, an attorney, is absolutely non-disclosure. That's so important to people in this industry, and I think that um, we've been pretty good about that. Absolutely. Uh, what is, is there a specific 
personality trait that's required to work with those ultra high net worth clients? I mean, you did mention a few of the ways that you help them, but if someone is thinking about, wow, well, that's an area that I really want to cater to, are there a specific personality traits they should possess? And are there specific tools in their toolkit that they should add on to if they're looking to get into that market? I think it's important to remember that we are service providers and so any client, but particularly somebody that's, you know, wealthy or famous is used to being told, yes, the client is always right. So there is a balance between really being available to them during a very difficult time. A lot of it's handholding. A lot of times people will call me after hours on a weekend and I know there's nothing I can do for them. The courts are closed, but having a conversation, talking through it, making them feel better, strategizing, explaining a lot of them because why would the, so many people say to me, I've never been through this before. Well, of course you haven't been through it before. So explaining it to a way in them to, in a way that doesn't feel condescending, that makes them, you know, plain language, not using big words, trying to make yourself feel important. Remember they are the customer and you want to service them. At the same time, I do believe that a lot of the uber wealthy or uber famous are used to being told yes. And I think if there's something that they have an unrealistic expectation about, it's our job to say no. That's just not going to happen. I don't want to create delusions of grandeur with you. You will ultimately be disappointed. And I have had people say to me, I really appreciate you being so honest about it. Everybody else is saying yes, yes, yes to me. And if you, when you said no, it made me realize this person's going to be very candid with me about what she can and can't do within the boundaries of the law. Mm -hmm. And for these specific personalities, when they do come to you and maybe they don't have someone helping them on the financial side or the legal side, what do you look for in someone that you refer them to? You know, what does that person's personality uh, have to be like for you to be like, Mary, go work with Bob or Jim at XYZ Firm? It's going to depend on the, the, the client, him or herself. Again, if it's somebody that isn't super business savvy, doesn't have a background in business or corporate or finances, I will pick one of my colleagues, whether it is a forensic accountant or a financial advisor, who really speaks plain language. I've put a lot of my female clients who are not in the workforce with a few of my female um, investment advisors and, and business managers because they've said, I really like that she understands that it's like important for me to wear La Mer. And I know it's expensive, but when we're coming up with a budget, I love La Mer and I might be willing to cut out some other things in favor of this space product or, you know, this. So having a older male, not understanding person wouldn't be good for them because they don't want to be talked down to. They don't want to be saying, well, what are you using this $250 jar of face cream? That's ridiculous. Somebody that really understands and will work with you, I think is important. By the same token, if you have someone who's kind of a financial or corporate veteran and has been in there for a long time, they may not want a younger, hipper female, something like that. So you try to match personalities with people that you think will go well. A lot of our clients come to us already represented by management. That's actually how we get them. And again, if they're wealthy, there's usually been someone behind the helm. But for the most part, I'm trying to place people with, um, you know, sometimes a couple will come to us and the business manager is only going to stay with one. So I have to find the other one. Once we get them through the difficulty of determining what all the assets are and how to divide them, one of them is going to end up getting a new business manager. And we have to place that person with somebody who can actually adhere to the judgment, figure out what they're going to be getting, tax ramifications, et cetera, and really work with them towards their next chapter. Absolutely. That's amazing. If I'm a new financial advisor, or let's say I've been longstanding, but haven't had a chance to work with you, how do you recommend if I wanted to get started being on that Rolodex of new referral sources for you uh, to get that started? And whether that be you or maybe someone who's based in Wisconsin, they wanna work with a family lawyer in Wisconsin, what do you recommend as the, the best strategies for getting in front of the family lawyer, but also what do you need in return um, right. to be able to feel comfortable with them? I'd say send, you know, send an email, an intro email. A lot of, I get a lot of like invitations to lunch, invitations to coffee. I don't have a ton of time. If I'm not in my office, I want to be home. I'm sorry. I want to be home with my family. Like I don't go for long lunches. I don't do as much networking. I would definitely try to go to some of the bar events, you know, that the, whatever the, the 
the local bar association. We've got the Beverly Hills Bar. We've got the Los Angeles County Bar. If there are specified, we've got a family law section. If they're having events, I would go. If you have the funds, I would try to sponsor one of them. So as soon as we sign into that event, we see this company or this individual has sponsored this event. We say, oh, who is that? Get your information in front of them to the extent you can. We don't necessarily need to have a whole meal or even a whole coffee, but we want to see what you do, lay it out, and tell us a little bit about your pricing because if we can refer the out spouse in a case, let's say the non-moneyed party, now that the business manager for the couple has said, I'm going to stick with the money, now you need to find somebody else. Say, hey, I'm happy to take some of those people. A lot of times they're women. A lot of times they've got a certain budget that they're going to live on through their spousal or child support or whatever the division of property is. Say, this is one of my specialties. I really like representing women who have come out of a divorce and really need to to be able to get back on their feet, figure out how to budget. So many people come to me, and again, oftentimes it's women saying, I'm so embarrassed. I, I was married for 20 years. I have no idea what we have, what we earn, what I spend. He took care of everything. And I say, you know, I get it, and you don't have to be embarrassed. This, You will never be in this situation again. And throughout their divorce, they really learn about finances and how to do it. They may not be the person picking the stocks, but they certainly will be the person that is figuring out how to balance a checkbook, how to do QuickBooks. You may, as a new business entity, want to come in and say, I'm happy to learn with them. I'm happy to teach them. I'm happy to handhold them through it and start their next chapter. I think that would be a really good entree for family law attorneys to meet younger or newer money management professionals. Absolutely. So speaking the like speaking down to their level of understanding, be willing to teach them a little bit about what they're doing. Talking about their pricing, that seems to be an important their fees. It seems to be an important thing for you to learn about the financial advisor. Meanwhile, a yeah. lot of financial advisors that I work with try to say, "Oh, we'll talk about that later," but it seems like it's uh, it's on the forefront of what you need. If we're going to refer, I know our clients are going to say, well, how much do they cost? I want to be able to say, this is a pretty reasonable amount. You should talk to her. And if you have some kind of more than just a card, but some kind of a one sheet, maybe with a picture of you, you know, laying out what you do, what you're good at, very plain language, it's easy for us to just give it or click it in an email to a client and say, maybe check her out. She seems really interesting. She's personable. She, I don't know her, but you know, let me put pass this on to you. We're always looking for somebody to refer these folks to, and we want to do right by them. We know that it doesn't end just by virtue of the divorce decree being signed. The other thing is, you know, you mentioned my online divorce website, It's Over Easy. We have on It's Over Easy an index, meaning in each state, we have professionals that free of charge, we refer to users. So let's say they've used It's Over Easy, they've gotten their divorce, but now they do need a money manager, a bookkeeper, an accountant to take them into the next phase. We have lists of professionals. See if you can get on a list like the index with It's Over Easy. And there's many, many other ones through, again, the local bar associations, through different, and if there must be an accounting, you know, some kind of an association there. Get on listservs, get on lists because like, people sometimes just do a cold call. They, you know, type in a, a number or a name and then you pop up and they'll give you a try. Absolutely. That's, those are all amazing uh, ideas. And I'll definitely make sure that we have all of those hyperlinks as far as where we could see all of the different ones. What have you had as a great example of best practice with working with a financial advisor? You mentioned how you make that initial introduction, but in the life cycle of a divorce, talk to us a little bit about some best practices, what the financial advisor could come to you with from their client so that they're well prepared, they're limiting the billing, uh, billing rates for you and for the client. So financial advisors are our most important piece of the puzzle. I mean, again, not when dealing with custody, but when dealing with the estate, okay? I say to every client, both in my office and not, and not so over easy, there's like four corners of a financial picture. You've got what you have, what you owe, what you earn, and what you spend. Those individuals that come to us with a financial advisor already in place, those guys usually know most of that stuff. And if they don't, they can pull together a file, pull up whatever the last year's financial statement is, tax returns. You guys have a whole different way of looking at numbers and figuring it out. So the best way, I think, for a family to be able to save money if they're getting divorced, if they have a financial advisor, get that person in touch with your with your family law attorney because that person's going to be the, the, the provider of all information. 
all of those four corners, what you have, what you owe, what you make, what you spend, those have to be disclosed and exchanged before we can ever come up with a deal. If I've got somebody that's got a good financial advisor, business manager, bookkeeper, those folks get together, maybe it's all in one office or maybe it's different people, and they provide us with that information, which is then comprised of, what's, it's called a preliminary declaration of disclosure in California. That's the document that we look at when we need to figure out what the deal is going to be, both for what support's going to be, child and spousal, and what the division of property is going to be. Whether you're in a community property state like California, where everything earned during the marriage gets divided in half, or in an equitable distribution state like New York, you have to be able to have those four corners. And the financial advisor is generally the person who either has that information or can get it relatively quickly. So we love you guys. Uh, but if a woman is going through a divorce and she doesn't even know if they have a financial advisor, uh, what do you recommend to her? Should she come to you without having spoke? Because sometimes they don't want to talk to the financial advisor because the financial advisor is covering right. both her and the spouse. What do you recommend they should come in with uh, to be you know, as prepared as possible? Generally, the financial advisor has a fiduciary duty to both people. So again, when he or she is ready, you go to them and say, I think, first of all, let's even dial it back if you are married whether things are going well or not you should know whether you have a financial advisor and you should be able to ask either your spouse or that financial advisor for information about your finances if you can't that's a problem right away and again maybe at that point it's too late but if you're a married person it is very important to be able to have that kind of information and i tell young couples that are about to get married don't one person abdicate the financial responsibility to the other. Maybe one person is paying most of the bills, writing the checks, in charge of investments. Great. The other person has to be aware, whether you're having a quarterly meeting or a monthly meeting, just the two of you or with a third per person that's the financial advisor, stay abreast of this information, not even so much because you want to be in control and make changes, but because it's important to know. I've had so many people come to me and say, I don't even know what we're doing. And then a month or two later gets the declaration of disclosure and they're in horrible debt, but they've been driving around in expensive cars, living in an expensive house, going for private plane travel. They're staying in five-star hotels, going to restaurants, wearing designer clothing, debt, debt, debt. And one of the people, one of the ones that was spending the money had no idea this was going on. You can't be a good partner unless you're able to actually interact and discuss financial issues. It's not sexy and it's not fun but it is important absolutely well thank you so much laura for your time this was i know you are we're up for time any final things that you want to leave things off with as far as the ways that you or you're looking forward to working with financial advisors and best practices for them if they're looking to tap into that ultra high net worth market I just, I think for the ultra high net worth, networking is really important, meeting people, um, you, you financial advisors, like I said, I think most of us family law attorneys and most of the people that are in the high net worth sphere recognize how important you are. Cracking in there, getting in, being personable, giving, inundating us with information, even if we don't need it, it might end up stuck in the Rolodex of our brain or our computer and we go back and we pick it up and we refer somebody. And I think those relationships are so important that I absolutely would advise people keeping them up, working on them and maintaining them. Are you doing anything just as a final one uh, on your on your own digital marketing strategies in case you know more of the world is going to go online and networking is going to be limited? We're going to be more here. Um, are there specific things you've started or are doing more of online so you can network with the ultra high net worth? Uh, not as much with the ultra high net worth. I think that's going to be kind of the last sector to change, frankly. I mean, we do a lot of the these webinars. I've done a lot of Zoom, you know, conferences with people, but I'm not finding the ultra wealthy participating in those as much as people, because again, we can still do one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls even at my hourly rate. A lot of those people are much more private. They don't want to be in a Zoom room with a bunch of other people. So I definitely think educating is important, and so we're participating in those. Those. But for right now, and again, on the marketing, we've done so much of that through It's Over Easy. I have a podcast called, All, called All's Fair with Laura Wasser that's on iHeart. People can tune in, listen. It's interesting. I have actually gotten a couple of clients at the firm who said, 
I heard your podcast and I just wanted to know you. I wanted you to be my lawyer. So things that you can do outside of the box to kind of network and get yourself out there, I think are really important. Things you can participate in, particularly now, because we have an opportunity to do things that you don't actually have to go anywhere. Like when I went to Florida in December, the yeah. one I'm doing uh, for the American Bar Association on Thursday, I was supposed to be in New Orleans this week doing it. We're doing it online for a bunch of lawyers that are going to be tuning in to talk about things that you can do to improve your practice and other things, side gigs it's called. So we're talking about it's over easy and we're talking about the podcast and we're talking about things we can do to really bolster uh, familiarity so that people feel comfortable when we do come out of this quarantine and people are going to be trying to be, you know, piecing their wealth back together, calling on financial advisors, maybe switching it up a little bit and thinking about new ways to save and make money. Absolutely. Well, this could not be more incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us. I'll make sure I hyperlink your podcast. It's over easy as well as your own website. And we'll definitely be in touch for future sessions like this. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Amy. Bye, Thank Laura. you for reaching out. Bye. Of course. Thank you.